exciting things for me. I, I've been with Crew many years, and then another organization that I'll, I'll remain with. But one thing that I've always wished I had access to is a 501c3 nonprofit where I could, like, just do several things. One is, like, to work on projects and have the funding under that organization to, like, really just really bring change. And so instead of, like, always being a part of another organization, just have an organization where I can do, like, where I can just, like, be a part of the whole conversation. And so I started working on Hope of the Poor probably 15 years ago. And it's just been a slow process of, like, I finally get a lawyer. I'm not here in the United States that much. And so, like, when I'd be home, I'd, like, you know, have a conversation, finally got a lawyer. And uh, then, you know, all the paperwork and everything like, that goes into it. And then, but to be honest, during the whole time, I'm like, I'm not sure I'll probably ever use this. I, know, I don't know what this is going to look like, you know, when I do get everything done. Well, I came to the end of we, we received permission from the, from the IRS to be a nonprofit and everything like that, and, which is great. And it was at the same time I met Danny, and, uh, like, I, I just was incredibly called, like, like, to work alongside of him to change the conversation, not just in the United States, but just around the world on how we treat the poor, and to take some of our ideas of, like, how we really, like, we, we feel incredibly convicted about, like, loving the poor as Christ himself and, you know, taking some of those ideas and being able, like, to help a generation connect with the poor. And so we started Hope of the Poor together with that purpose. And so I live in Mexico City. I'm there probably uh, nine months of the year. I'm back three months a year. I go to Alaska and do mission work up there with the native Alaskans um, every summer for two months. And so Uh, But Danny's here most of the time. And so what we've done now with Danny full time, like he's, he travels around singing and sharing sharing stories about the the poor. Most weeks he's he's probably in front of like like several thousand people. Goes into high schools, goes into like groups, you know, just all kinds of amazing places like that now that he's full time with me. But then also he runs our Winnebago Macy ministry. So tomorrow, um, like this past week, we took 42 high school seniors up to the reservation and had a Hope of the Poor mission reaching out to the kids on, on, the, on, the, on the reservation. Tomorrow uh, we're going back and we're uh, starting a youth group in like a community youth group in Winnebago, and Danny will go up and be a part of that. It's close to Omaha, so Danny works on projects like that. So I'm in Mexico full-time, and, and he's in, in, in working with the natives full-time, Native Americans full-time. Like that is exactly what we love to do. We love to take the, the gospel to places that nobody else is proclaiming. My life verse has always been 15, Romans 15, 20, and if you know what that means, or that says is like my... Uh, it's always been my ambition or my desire to take the gospel where, where Christ is not being proclaimed, so I'm not building on somebody else's foundation. That's always where I want to be. That's why I, I thought it'd be fun to talk about uh, uh, going out to Shadron and Wayne State, places like that where, where like, the gospel is not being proclaimed, and then going to Mexico City, places where the gospel is not being proclaimed, and that's what I always want, hope of the poor. That's what I always want to be, a, we, be about. And uh, so it's really cool for you guys to meet Danny and uh, just to hear about Hope of the Poor. I also want to introduce Tom. And Tom, uh, a lot of you guys know Tom because he's from Ainsworth and he's awesome. But every time we're like playing somewhere close enough for him to drive to, he comes and does his box thing. I don't even know. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And Tom's mother's here. And then, uh, let's see, I wanted to introduce Zach. He's that guy uh, wandering around here. He's in the back. But he actually works with me full time. Uh, He's Mexican. He was born in France. And then his parents immigrated to Mexico City. I found him on a a campus. And uh, he was just like the coolest kid. And, you know, we just like started working together little by little. And then uh, then about a year ago, 
his mother told him, like, okay, Zach, you need to get a real job. I'm like, no, I don't want to lose you. And so I, like, I, like, started raising some support so I could have Zach. And so he works for me full-time. He's not fully supported, but uh, he's, like, a full-time missionary with Hope of the Poor now and just is always with me. It's just awesome to have. He's 22 years old. He's, uh, he's just great because when I'm with the poor, he always kind of has, like, eyes that are looking around, and I don't have to, like, be, like, worried about safety all the time because Zach's always watching and, and you know, just, like, always having someone with you because Danny's not always in Mexico City, but Zach always is. And then we, always, we also have a full-time missionary up in Alaska, and he's working with us full-time, and then we have one more person, and she's in Mexico, and she's a former staff street person that we've taken off the street, and then she runs our food cart ministry, which is super cool. Um, I wanted to give you two challenges. I wanted to tell you, um, this is not a big surprise, but I am a fisherman. Uh, if you know me, like, I have always just lived to fish. That's what I do. Like, I mean, we grew up north of O'Neill, and the Blackbird Creek runs through my dad's our property and my mom's now. And every, I was probably, I don't even think I was in kindergarten. Or I, was, I wasn't even that. I don't know how old, but I can just remember just always being down there. And back then, we, were, we didn't have fishing poles like we do now, but you didn't need them. You just made them out of sticks, and you put some fishing line and some hooks, and then dug some worms. It's like a whole day process, you know, by the time you do that and you're a kid. Finally get down there like you're catching minnows, and it's just awesome. And put them in my dad's stock tank, and then the cool thing is then you could fish out of the stock tank too. So if you didn't have time to go down to the creek, you could just fish right there, which is just awesome. But, and then, you know, once I got old enough, uh, my Uncle Merlin's got a farm pond, and uh, my cousin Kent's got a farm pond, and my dad's got a farm You know, I was always, like, just going around just catching. Like, it wasn't about the catching. It was just, like, the fishing part is what I really like, and I just have always wanted just to be a fisherman, and it's not the catching, like, I've got pictures of, like, big, small, that's not what it's all about, it is, like, you never know what's going to happen, and what you always just need to do is just, like, always cast your line, now, (laughs) I don't know that much about fishing, but I know, like, whenever, you're not going to catch, I'm not catching any fish right now, like, I, I have to be out fishing, you have to show up, to catch fish. And that's like the biggest, like the biggest thing that I always tell like all our staff and us, like we have to show up. Like those street kids, like they, like God wants to work in their lives and the people at the dump, God wants to work in their life, but it's not going to happen probably until we show up with 25 chickens and start loving on these people. Like that's always like the biggest thing. Just show up and, and just always be a fisherman. I don't have it all figured out. I don't want to have it all figured out. I don't want to be one of those professional guys on TV that it's like, yeah, you do this and this. It's like a science. Like, no, if I get to that point, I want to, like, not get to that point. I just want to be a kid again on the Blackbird Creek, dropping a worm in the water, and I don't know what's going to happen. You're just, like, waiting for something to happen. That's what it means, I believe, to be, like, a, just a Christian who just believes God t- to, uh, to, to bring in, like, in results. Like, you just, like show up in people's lives and just expect God to work and, and, you know, and just wait for him to work and don't have it all figured out. That's my, that's my challenge to us is just to always show up. And I think there's always situations, always places that God's calling us to, and it's hard. Like, like the hardest thing for us is actually getting up to Winnebago and knowing that God had been calling me for years to go up there and Danny for years and it's like, okay, just go up there and, and be willing to fail. And just like, we don't know what we're doing. We're just like showing up, you know, with a guitar and a fire and a vision to start a youth group at this point, you know. And, uh, but I think that that's the, that's the encouragement I wanted to give you is to like always just show up. Like don't stop showing up even though it gets tough. And even though, because it's not about the results, it's about, it's not about the catching of the fish, it's, it's actually just being a fisherman, that's what, that's what it means to be a Christian to me. Um, I wanted to tell you one really cool thing, is I, you know, I was working uh, in the Congress in Mexico, 
and then you're always meeting really cool people. Well, I met the personal assistant to the past president, and we just instantly became friends. And he's my best friend today in Mexico. And, uh, and right away, he, he told me, he said, uh, and he, he was like the personal assistant to the, the past president and first lady. And he told me, um, you know, I, as soon as this is over, like, this is a really rough job because, like, when you work for the president, you're just, like, on call all the time. And he says, as soon as this president's out of office, and in Mexico, the president stays in office for six years, and they can't run again. And so he goes, as soon as I'm done with this job, I want to work to start homes to save the lives of the unborn. I'm like, really? That is amazing. Like, I would love to be involved in, the, in, in that. And uh, in any way I can help, he goes, well, I really feel like we're supposed to go to uh, the United States to start these homes from Mexico City. And I'm like, really, where do you want to go? And he goes, Nebraska. And he had no idea. I'm from Nebraska. I'm like, oh, man, this sounds like a setup. I am not going to tell this guy. <laughs> like, somebody t- could have told him I'm from Nebraska. So I agreed to meet with the founders of the organization. And this home had been going in Mexico for about 10 years. I was super impressed. I felt like this model is not being used in the United States. We need this here to save the lives of the unborns. Because what they do is they take mothers off the street. So they like take like people like street kids, people in really bad places, and then they give them a home, provide all their medical care, everything's free. And they can live there for up to eight months after the baby's born. And they can adopt the baby. They can keep the baby. They'll teach them how to be mothers. All these things. It's a great model. We need this. We need more of this. There's not enough. I don't care if there is one in Omaha. We need need a bunch. We need these all over the place. So um, so I met the the founders of this organization. And there are these wonderful people that have been doing this for 10 years. And, you know, this big vision. Like, yeah, we... You know, we think that God's like going to take this international. I'm like, really? Where do you want to go? And she said, well, the first place we're going to start, that, that God's calling us to start our first home is in Nebraska. I'm like, oh, man, that's crazy. So I said, okay, I'm from Nebraska. I, you know, I'm like, I believe it now. Like, this is legit. So if God's calling them to Nebraska, like, I would love to help. And so I'm thinking, they have all these... Uh, all these contacts, everything set up. I'm like, if you, you know, if you need some help, let me know. I'm, you know, I can drive you around Nebraska. I'm from there. So, well, uh, so we agreed on a trip to Nebraska. So I'm coming up from Mexico City, where I'm a missionary, and I'm coming on a mission trip to Omaha, which is so awesome. <laughs> and, and like, I was coming home as a missionary, crazy. And so uh, we came up. Um, well, well, first of all, like. You know, it was a four-day trip, and, I'm, and, they're, and I just thought, we're going to meet with all these contacts that they've made, or for some reason they're going to Nebraska. And so I'm like, who are we meeting with? And they, and they said, no, we don't know anyone. We're just called. Like, we were, like, flipping through a magazine and saw Nebraska. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no, this is terrible. We've already bought tickets. I... I've been in Mexico for a while. I don't know people who run houses like that. I don't even know who to call. So I start calling everybody I know in Omaha and trying to get meetings, and people are just like, what? really, they're from Mexico? Do they want jobs? Like, no, they own companies, and they work for the president. These are really important people. And, uh, and I mean, it's just like nothing like this had ever been done in, in Nebraska. I mean, people don't come here from Mexico to start organizations and mission. I mean, usually they do want jobs, and so it's just people, nobody could get their mind around it. So finally, we just decided, okay, we're just going to come up and just believe God. And, uh, and even if it's just like a four-day, you know, just four days in Nebraska, that'd be awesome. So we came up. The place that we showed up where we found, like within two years after that trip, a home was started in Omaha. And the place, what happened was, I didn't know anybody, they didn't know anyone, but we knew that they were doing late-term abortions in Bellevue. And so we went there to pray. And there were other people praying. And these people were the ones that had a broken heart for the unborn. 
not just to like, not just to be on the sidelines, but to actually do things because they would have people come out and want to save their baby and they wouldn't have a home or a place to like take them. And they were the perfect ones to start at the core of this home. Uh, but we set up the, uh, the nonprofit here in Nebraska with the idea that we're going to believe God for 50 of these homes in 50 cities within 10 years. And so we've been on, like I don't work on this full time. I'm just like, I just see updates because it's so cool. And I, I go to some meetings once in a while. But um, we launched our first expansion home out of Omaha. Well, the first year in Omaha, 32 babies were saved. And every year since then. And then last year, we opened up our first home, our first expansion home in Dallas, which is so cool. And now uh, we've got homes that are starting. They're getting ready to open in Cincinnati and Miami. And so we're just kind of like on this track to like have 50 homes and then 100 homes. And that all happened just from showing up. 